Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Darren Duffy with us today. To most of you, uh, no introductions needed. But just in case, I say a few words about <laughs> Darrell. Okay. Okay. I see some young faces there. So uh, uh, Darrell Duffy is the Dean Richard Distinguished Professor of Finance at Stanford Graduate School of Business. Uh, he's a, a fellow of the Society and a fellow of American Academy of Arts and uh, Social Science, Arts and Sciences. Okay. Uh, he was also independent director of Moody's for 10 years, from uh, 2008 to 2018. Okay. And uh, uh, most importantly, he chaired this uh, International uh, Financial Stability Board's Market Participants uh, Group on Reference Rate Reform in 2013-2017. So the, word the stability of world financial system depends on Darius' report, <laughs> <laughs> written a couple of years ago. <laughs> So uh, uh, Darry also gave this uh, 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 Fish Schwarz lecture, uh, uh, lecture at the World Congress of Economic Society in 2015. Okay? Uh, in Singapore, uh, Darry is also highly demanded. He's, he was demanded by the industry to give a workshop yesterday. And he's also, uh, 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 many people want to meet him, including our Deputy Prime Minister. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, it's fortunate uh, that Darry is willing to spend uh, two days with us. To, Mornings. Okay. More than willing. Mornings. <laughs> okay. So Daryl will talk about redesigning over the counter financial markets. Okay. Daryl, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yenang. <clears throat> Yenang didn't mention that I'm also here to collaborate with him and uh, his former student, Lei Chiao, who's here. So thank you. Um, this is uh, joint work. Uh, well, actually, it's, a, it's a, an extension of my Fisher Schultz lecture uh, to bring it up to date based on new joint work uh, that I've been doing with Leif Anderson, Antje Berndt, Piotr Dvorak, Yang Sung, Hao Shang Ju, and Yi Chao Ju uh, in a series of papers that are all looking at the functioning of financial markets, particularly over the counter markets. Those are markets where there's no central exchange, where you must go find a counterparty with whom to trade, negotiate trade, negotiate a price and then move on and uh, trade again later with someone else if possible. So these over-the-counter markets are the foundation for most of the assets traded in the world. I know, for those, I know many of you do finance for a living, but some of you that don't do finance for your normal job might not realize that when you look at the television screen about what's happening in exchange-traded markets, where everything shows up on a screen and everybody is going to the stock exchange, that's just a small fraction of the world's assets that are traded. Most financial assets are not traded on an exchange. They're traded by picking up a phone and calling a bank and asking for a price, or by going to a screen where you ask two or three banks for a price. And because of the frictions associated with this kind of a market that covers the majority, again, of the working financial assets in the world, it's very important to focus attention on the efficiency of those markets. Because of the financial crisis that happened in 2007 to 2009, major changes in regulation and major changes in the cost of funding uh, new securities by big banks have dramatically revised the way that these markets work. And uh, I and my collaborators have been uh, trying to understand what's going on. We think we've made a little bit of progress. Today's talk, although this is an institute for mathematical studies, is mostly, it has a little bit of math, but it's mostly um, motivation, some institutional knowledge, some concepts um, that, that uh, uh, focus on what we really most want to know. There is a little bit of mathematical modeling. And then in the second part of the talk tomorrow, um, there will be a little bit more mathematical modeling because we have to model search-based techniques uh, by, by which an individual investor searches for the best price available in the market. Um, but it can get arbitrarily mathematical, as Yanung uh, can explain. Uh, he, he works on some of the most advanced techniques that are available in this area, involving non-standard analysis, which is his specialty. So maybe on another day, he can go into that. I think Lei spoke yesterday um, about the work that he and I and uh, Lei are doing in that area. OK, so I would like to keep this really informal. If you would just interrupt me and uh, ask for any, any questions, clarification, or uh, you want me to go deeper into some issue, or you 
actually disagree with uh, some of the concepts in terms of their importance, please just, um, just ask. So this is the kind of markets we're talking about, where the green dots are the major dealer banks. So these are household names like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, BNP Paribas, or maybe Standard Chartered here in, in Singapore. These green dots are there to intermediate trade. To, If you are a blue dot, like one of the customers, the C uh, dots, you will approach a green dot and you will ask for a price uh, bid, the meaning uh, the price they're willing to buy and an offer the price at which they're willing to sell some asset. You could think in terms of a government bond, a corporate bond, um, an interest rate swap, that's a derivative, a currency, a commodity. Many, most of the, as I said, most of the working assets in financial markets are traded by this method. The dealers are all connected to each other which means that if a dealer has too much or too little of some asset and it doesn't see other customers coming to take that position, the dealer can lay off the excess with another dealer. The dealers are completely connected to each other, but as you can see, the blue dots are not connected to each other at all. No blue dot trades with a blue dot. Blue dots can only trade with green dots. There's no law about that, it's just the way that the markets have endogenously formed. And in fact, there's a new paper on that uh, by a professor at Wharton University, former Stanford PhD statistics department. His name is Chao Juen Wang. And so if you're interested in why we have this core periphery structure, where the core is the green dots and the periphery is the blue dots, I recommend the paper by Chao Juen Wang. Here's the example of the core periphery structure for the credit default swap market. So this is the market for derivatives by which you can insure against the default of a corporation or a government. And as you can see, the, I'm colorblind, but I think the big, the big circles are mostly blue. Is that right? Yeah. So the big blue circles are the largest banks that are intermediating markets for credit default swaps. There are a few other large dots, but they're not taking customer orders. They're requesting customer positions from the, from the blue dots, which are the big banks. And that includes all the global important banks. The smaller dots, as you can see from the legend, are other financial firms, non-financial firms like corporations, insurance firms, and so on. So this is the organization of the credit default swap market in terms of trading sizes represented by the diameters of the dots and the links between them represented by the connecting lines. This is not specific only to the credit default swap market. As you can see from this diagram where I collected uh, similar pictures from other papers, this kind of core periphery structure is common to most financial markets that are not exchange traded, which means most financial markets. So on the top left, municipal bonds. Top center, asset-backed securities like credit uh, uh, collateralized debt obligations. Uh, right top is interbank market, where the biggest banks intermediate for the smaller banks on the outside periphery. Bottom left, interest rate swaps, the world's largest financial market, now over $600 trillion dollars, US dollars, notional, outstanding, very large market. Bottom center, credit default swaps, that's the one I showed you a moment ago. And bottom right, foreign exchange derivatives markets. This is just six examples, uh, whether you're talking currencies, commodities, corporate bonds, many other types of financial instruments. They're traded in the same manner by a small number, about 15 major global banks taking the majority, over 90% of all intermediation. And in the swaps market, it's 100%, literally 99.5 something uh, percent of all trade is intermediated by one of these small number, 10 to 15 major banks. Okay, what are the frictions involved in this uh, market design, which is not a great design for many, in many cases? Well, the first friction is that you have to go search for a counterparty. Again, this is the subject of the work by Yanang Lei and myself. Uh, and that, that's a friction. And then when you meet a counterparty that might have a suitable trade with you, you have to negotiate that trade. And your counterparty knows that if you don't accept the bid or offer, that you will have to go search again. And that gives the counterparty bargaining power. And that bargaining power will be used to exploit you for a bid offer spread, meaning a profit uh, that will be given to the bank that's, that's giving those quotes. You, if you're not a bank, are never supplying bids and offers, you're requesting bids and offers, except in rare circumstances. 
So that is an important friction because it gives partial monopoly power. When you're on the phone with one bank, as long as you're on the phone, that bank has monopoly power. And the outside option to search by going to another bank is not that attractive. Second, when you call the bank and you ask for price quotes, you do not know what is the going price in the market. You don't have an idea because this, there may be no up-to-date uh, reporting system for the transactions prices and quantities of trades that are occurring in the market. This market is said to be opaque or dark. In fact, I have a book called Dark Markets that's all about this subject. And uh, tomorrow, when we, uh, if, for any of you that happen to come back tomorrow morning at the same time, I'll be talking about the implications of that price opaqueness for the terms of trade between you and your counterparty, but not just for the prices, for the volume of trade, because that's where the social gains are achieved. The price, well, it's interesting to you, but socially speaking, it's a transfer to your counterparty. What really matters is whether the trades that should occur actually do occur. And that opaqueness, the degree to which you don't know the going price in the market, will reduce the volume of trade in a socially inefficient way. The next um, item that's an important friction that I've been focusing on in the last couple of years is the cost to the bank of taking a position on its own balance sheet, meaning the bank has to have the capital and the cash funding necessary to accommodate your trade desire and the cost to the bank shareholders of making that capital available and obtaining the cash funding is a substantially higher cost to the bank shareholder now than before the crisis. And today I'm going to focus on that particular issue. So that's called dealer funding costs. And that has, since the financial crisis, been dominating, in my view, the dominating friction in over-the-counter over markets. There's a lot of research, some of which I've cited here, Almost all of it is empirical, but we're just starting to theoretically understand where these balance sheet costs are coming from. Um, and then the last item, which I'm not going to be talking about uh, today, but is equally important in terms of a friction, is the opaqueness or asymmetric information with respect to the underlying asset quality. Here I'm not talking about opaqueness about what is the price for this asset at this moment in time. I already talked about that. Rather, I'm talking about you're calling the bank and either you or the bank knows more than the other about the, about the fundamental risk. So if it's a credit default swap um, that um, is written, that references a particular firm, let's call it uh, Tesla, because that's a firm that I suspect has lots of credit risk. And I call JP Morgan, I'm an insurance firm, and I ask for a bid or an offer on credit default swaps insuring Tesla debt. One of us may know more than the other about the quality of Tesla debt. And that will also have a big influence on over-the-counter market design and pricing. That is not going to be a focus today, but some of the papers in that literature are listed here. Okay, so here we go. Everybody hang on to your seats. We've got uh, about 45 minutes but I'm going to allow lots of time for your questions. So please ask me questions so that, uh, so that I get to learn what you're thinking about because I already know what I'm going to say. So as I said, today the, the main focus, uh, which is a relatively new topic, re a research topic, is the cost of you, a investor, one of the blue dots, the cost of accessing the dealer's balance sheet to get the dealer to buy your bonds or whatever it is you want to sell, or to obtain from the dealer positions that they already have. So we're going to talk about the cost to the dealer shareholders of accommodating your trades. This is a, how many of you have seen a balance sheet before? Hands, show of hands, please. Balance sheet, how many have seen it? Okay, so about half the audience. So let me explain. Uh, this is a little bit unconventional too. The left-hand side are the assets that are held by the bank. On the right-hand side are the claims by capital providers to the bank on those assets. Those claims are in two forms. Debt, which means the bank has borrowed money in order to finance the purchase of the assets. And that's shown in blue. And equity, meaning the bank has obtained, has issued equity shares to the market in order to obtain additional capital. And as you, 
well, those of you that have studied finance know the debt has first claim in case the bank cannot pay back. The equity holders come next. And they get any residual. Okay, so that's very important. Also important, if you're familiar with this diagram, usually the blue debt is shown as the face amount of obligation due and payable. I'm not going to use that convention. Today I'm going to show the blue rectangle is the market value of the debt. It's the market value of the debt claims on the bank. Okay? How much that debt is worth in the market. And that's important um, because, as you notice, the market value of assets is equal to the market value of debt plus the market value of equity. And we're going to be using that identity in what follows. Okay, so here we go. The bank is considering the purchase from you of a bond for, or some other asset that you want to sell. Okay, so that new asset is shown on the right-hand side, new asset. Okay, in light red. The bank has to make the decision. Will it buy the assets from you? And at what price would it be willing to do that? Okay, so let's take the easiest case. It's not the most interesting case in practice, but it's the easiest starter case in which the cash necessary to buy your asset is obtained by issuing more equity shares to the market. That's shown in new equity on the right-hand side at the bottom. Now, let's suppose first that markets are perfectly efficient. And so the market value of the new assets purchased from you is equal to the market value of the new equity that must be issued in order to fund that purchase. Does everybody get the diagram? Is, is, it, is it clear? I see lots of heads nodding. That's a good sign. OK, so we're going to suppose for the moment that markets are efficient. And on the next slide, we're going to see this trade will not happen. This trade will not happen. Why not? Well, let's take a look at the implication of this purchase for the lenders to the bank, the blue guys. The blue lenders, they're going to they're gonna say, wow, this is fantastic because now my claim against this bank, my lending to this bank is a lot safer because now the bank has more assets. So the blue box just got bigger because the market value of the debt claim has expanded because the, the debt is now safer. It has more assets behind it. OK, now we do some adding up. If the blue got bigger and the new green is the same size as the new red, there's only one thing that could have happened to the old green. It must have gotten smaller because the the two stacks have to add up. Okay, so this is uh, math, math 001. <laughs> okay, those two stacks have to add up. If the blue is bigger and the light green and light red match, it must be the case that the deeper green old equity shareholder value has gone down. Now we see why this trade will not occur. The traders who are offering you a price are being directed by the board of directors of the bank, the CEO of the bank, the chief financial officer of the bank. They're being told, do not make any trades that reduce the market value of equity. Only make trades that increase the market value of the equity. They're telling you, the traders, we're not here to increase the value of the debt. We're here to increase the value of the equity. This is not a good trade. Okay, This is a classic friction in markets that goes back to uh, some work by Stu Myers at MIT, which will probably someday win a Nobel Prize. It's so foundational. It's called debt overhang. So this is a beneficial trade for you that will not happen because of this um, debt overhang friction. However, maybe the trade will occur if you are willing to take a lower price when you sell your bonds to the bank. So the, the bank trader will come back to you and say, gosh, I'm not going to be able to give you fair market value for your bonds, or maybe they won't even tell you that. They'll just give you a low price, a low enough price to make the deal work for the bank shareholders. So they're going to offer you a price below the market value of your assets for these new assets. And that's the only way that this is going to work, is that the bank will offer you a below market price to take your bonds, a bid ask spread profit for the bank that more than offsets the cost to the old shareholders. 
Okay? This is, again, is, in terms of math, this is trivial, but in terms of its implications, it's relatively unmodeled in financial markets and quite important. The same thing is going to happen in swap markets, and I'm going to explain that. How many of you know what an interest rate swap is? It's a derivative security by which we exchange random cash flow for fixed cash flow. That's a swap. Okay, so we're going to now address the problem of this debt overhang friction in swap markets. And this friction already has a name in industry practice. It's called a funding value adjustment, which is the title of my paper with Leif Anderson and Yang Song. And we're going to see in action what would actually happen in real life uh, to this transaction if it were for swaps. For swaps, you need new collateral. Swaps mean you must provide margin and you must put some cash up front into the deal. This is a derivative security traded in the over-the-counter market that requires margin collateral and requires new cash to enter the trade. That means you need funding for the new margin and new cash. You normal source of funding is not equity. What I showed in the previous example, you would never see that on a daily practice basis. Nobody is going to issue new shares of equity into the market just to fund a trade. But they will borrow, the bank will borrow money, new debt, in order to fund the trade. And so the new collateral is added to the asset side. The new debt is added to the right-hand side, the liability side. And we're still going to get this debt overhang effect, even though the transaction does not look like a typical debt overhang situation. Again, under normal circumstances, this trade will be increasing the market value of the old debt. And therefore, if the trade is done on a competitive break-even basis, so that the new funding, new debt, is equal to the new assets, HQLA stands for high quality liquid assets or margin. If that, if that trade for the swaps is done on a fair value basis, then the old equity must have gotten smaller. And the shareholders will say, no, do not do this trade unless you get a sufficient trading profit. So you need to charge a bid offer spread, which is big enough to overcome that debt overhang effect. That debt overhang effect, as I mentioned, in industry practice has a name. It's called the funding value adjustment. There are a lot of other value adjustments that are used in the swap markets. They're called XVAs. So there's debt value adjustment, uh, there's capital value adjustment, there's credit value adjustment. The funding value adjustment is one of the XVAs that's become super important. And I'm going to explain why it's a very important friction. So in order for this swap trade to occur, the bank's bid offer profit on the trade must exceed the funding value adjustment in order to make it worthwhile for the shareholders. And remember, the banks are being operated by the shareholders or on their behalf. So we're talking about trades that increase the value of equity. These funding value adjustments, as I will show you in a mathematical model in a few minutes, are almost exactly the same as the credit spread on bank debt. Credit spread meaning the interest rate offered by the bank on its own debt minus the interest rate on risk-free debt. So that's called a credit spread. That's plotted on the vertical axis for the largest banks at the one-year maturity point. And you can see that the credit spreads before the financial crisis that started in 2007 were tiny. They were extremely small, like 10 or 15 basis points. Uh, how many know what a basis point is? OK, one basis point is 1 one-hundredth of 1%. One so if you think in terms of 10 basis points, as a credit spread, that's 10 one-hundredths of 1% 1 in interest rate for credit quality. That is a very, very small credit spread. And you might say, well, why were the banks being given such very low credit spreads? We'll get to that in a few minutes. But they were getting shockingly low credit spreads. They were able to fund their derivatives purchases, their bonds purchases, any kind of market-making services that they provided to you they were funding at very low cost. So markets in terms of bid offer spreads were very efficient, high liquidity. Then came the financial crisis. And as you can see in this, in this diagram, the credit spreads jumped way up. Well, of course they jumped up, it was a crisis. 
But after the crisis, they stayed much higher than before the crisis. So these much higher credit spreads that still apply today mean, going back to this funding value adjustment, the cost of funding this, the new assets has gotten much bigger because the cost of funding are almost exactly the same as these credit spreads. I'll give you an explicit mathematical formula uh, based, uh, you know, theorem proof mathematical formula in just a few minutes. And hopefully you'll agree that these funding spreads are almost exactly the same as credit spreads. So that means now when you call a bank and ask for a trade, the bank must earn a profit against you at least as large as its own credit spread. So if the bank pays a credit spread of 50 basis points, that is half of 1% per year, then you are going to have to donate to the bank a 50 basis point profit in order for the bank to conduct the trade. That is a very big friction. Okay, that's called debt funding costs or funding value adjustment. And in the common language on Wall Street, it's called the cost of balance sheet. That's a very ambiguous, opaque phrase, cost of balance sheet. But basically it means how much it costs the shareholders of the bank to make the space on their balance sheet to accommodate your trade desires. And that cost, as you can see, is now a factor of five bigger than it was before the crisis. Okay, here are the funding value adjustments just for interest rate swaps for some of the major banks that were showing up in their um, accounting disclosures up until 2014. After 2014, this practice of how they disclosed this became very controversial. We discussed the accounting controversy in our paper, but it's not the subject for today. Since 2014, they've stopped disclosing this, but my sources tell me that there are still including these funding value adjustments in their, in their accounts. Um, and that's a misunderstanding on their part about where those go, but they really do exist. There are some significant costs. And this is only for one small component, uh, not small, but it's only one component of the market. There's a lot more funding costs for everything else. I'm gonna do an example in a few minutes that's based on foreign exchange funding value adjustments. Okay, so just to remind you, in the case of an interest rate swap, uh, we need, uh, you know, you can be our, uh, our client, okay? Uh, who's, who can be uh, our dealer? Can I ask you? Sure. What is your name? Junjie. Junjie. Okay, Junjie is the bank. Yunung is the client. Uh, Yunung calls Junjie and says, what's the price on the interest rate swap by which the client will pay some variable interest rate X to Junjie and Junjie will pay Junjia will pay back a constant uh, on some future date. So this could be a foreign exchange contract. It could be an interest rate contract where X is uh, interest rate, a floating interest rate like LIBOR. Uh, it could be almost any random payment. Okay, so that's the deal that they are going to sign. And now we're going to talk about Yanung's funding costs for doing this deal. So what uh, Junjia is going to do once he gets this position from Yanung is he is going, he doesn't want this extra inventory sitting on his balance sheet. Remember, it's costly to expand your balance sheet. He will then trade it off uh, with somebody else in the audience. So he'll sell the position to another dealer. And when he does that, he has to give margin or collateral that backs the trade because that's required in the interdealer market that you provide initial margin or IM. However, Yanung is just a client. He's not required to provide initial margin. Well, that means that Drinja needs to fund the initial margin requirement, which is roughly speaking about 10 days, uh, 10 days worth of uh, value change at the 90, 95% confidence interval. So basically, the initial margin is a guarantee uh, that if Yanung uh, or Drinja's counterparty doesn't perform, they'll be able to cover it with the collateral or margin. Okay, that collateral needs to be funded in debt markets. Um, the other thing that could happen is that Yanung does provide some margin, but with a legal restriction that it not be reprovided to someone else, that it's held in a segregated account. In that case, Drinja still needs to come up with cash funding for the margin that he gives to the other dealer. OK, 
Okay? In some cases, the margin is provided to a central counterparty. How many have heard of central counterparties? There's a big math finance literature now on central counterparties. And these are basically clearing houses for guaranteeing that trades will perform. And these now hold uh, in excess of 300 trillion US dollars of interest rate derivatives today, the biggest one being the London Clearinghouse. So Yunung will have to supply margin to that clearinghouse. Uh, pardon me, Jinja will have to supply margin to the clearinghouse. That is a, an alternative way that he has to fund this trade. Because of these um, requirements by which you provide margin and you bear counterparty uh, risk, markets have developed new methods for reducing the use of balance sheet. Okay, so I'm, this is a completely side topic, but it's very exciting from a mathematical viewpoint. There's a lot of new math work going on in this area. For anyone that's interested, send me an email later, and I'll send you some of the math work that's going on. But here's the idea on a very simplistic example. So on the left, we have the swap positions in, let's say, billions of dollars of some particular swap between five different dealers. So you have dealers D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, and as you can see, uh, this graph in which the, the nodes are the dealer balance sheets and the links are the counterparty exposures on interest rate swaps, they include a circle. So there's a loop between dealers two, three, and four, which is a counterclockwise loop of uh, 60, 40, and 50. The minimum size of that loop is 40. So you can see that on that loop, there's kind of a redundancy Everybody is at least 40 in one direction and at least 40 in the other direction. Somehow or other, this loop is wasting balance sheet space because that loop has to be collateralized with margin. That's expensive. It would be ideal if they could get to the position on the right-hand side, which is equivalent from a market risk viewpoint, but has smaller positions. So on the right-hand side, dealers two, three, and four now have reduced by 40, all of the links in the node, which means on a net basis they're the same, but less margin, less collateral, less funding costs, lower use of balance sheet. How do we get from the left hand to the right hand? The problem was, before the crisis, beginning to be addressed by a new financial technology firm in Stockholm called TriOptima. And TriOptima realized that there was uh, a opportunity for a data science firm with lots of mathematical sophistication to search the dealer network on the left-hand side for these redundant loops. It would search for the loops like the one between dealers two, three, and four, and then it would suggest a robotic or algorithmic suggestion of trades between those three dealers that would introduce a clockwise trade between each pair in the loop of 40, 40 billion. The dealers could not do this on their own because the deal, this is an opaque market. You can't see everybody else's positions. You only know your own positions. So the dealers had not enough data to conduct this trade on their own. They needed the assistance of TriOptima to search. And when you get into a high dimensional set of swaps with a large set of dealers, it is a very combinatorially intense optimization problem, which TriOptima developed algorithms for, and has now resulted in the reduction of swaps. Here the reduction is 40 billion times three, 120 billion. The total reduction that has occurred by this year, most of it since the financial crisis, is 1.2 quadrillion dollars of swaps. Now, if you know what a quadrillion is, it's a thousand trillion, or you could call it a million billion, or you could call it 10 to the 12th power. It is a very big number that has been completely eliminated. The only cost is a small fee that you pay to TriOptima, and then you get all your collateral back from all that, uh, those unnecessarily large positions. So this is a fantastic success story for applied math and it's being used now in the foreign exchange markets. It's mathematically much harder there by a firm called Locked Markets in New York. So this is a very exciting development in applied math, but most importantly, it's reducing these funding costs 
so that when you call the dealer and ask the dealer to take your trade, when Yanung calls Drinja and asks for the trade, Drinja knows that he can keep his balance sheet costs down a little bit because he can use these compression trades to lower the use of balance sheet. Yes? So does this apply to market without central counterparties? Yes, both with and without central counterparties. It's a great question. So there were, if there were only one kind of swap, let's say 10-year US dollar quarterly LIBOR swaps, then already, as you figured out just by thinking about it, already the netting occurs at the central counterparty. However, if the swaps are some of them eight and a half years, some of them 11 and a half years, some of them have 10 years, uh, and there are, some of them are quarterly LIBOR uh, coupons and some of them are semi-annual LIBOR coupons. It's a, there's no exact netting, but the clearinghouse needs exact netting. So what they do is they ask Trioptima to come in and now it gets really interesting. Instead of doing, instead of doing a loop of one type of swap, it looks for among all of Dringea's portfolio of swaps, and all of everybody else's portfolio of swaps, it looks for a bunch of trades across all maturities, all coupon tenors, that leaves everybody approximately the same within a tiny risk tolerance, but massive reduction in gross positions, massive reduction in collateral requirements, and much lower funding costs. And if you're interested in that problem, let me know afterwards. <laughs> so it's, all, it's an even higher dimensional problem. I went to visit Trioptima recently in their, in their Stockholm office. And um, I worked with them on how to adapt that portfolio compression to a new problem related to the work that you know, I mentioned on LIBOR transition. So he mentioned the work I did on the Financial Stability Board for going from LIBOR to new reference rates. That portfolio compression at the central counterparty is a way to convert from old LIBOR to new reference rate contracts. OK. so. Just to give you an idea, in the interest rate swap market, uh, the vertical axis shows the gross market value in trillions of dollars US. So this is not the notional amount of derivatives. This is the actual market value of outstanding derivatives. And before the crisis, the actual market value was going up exponentially to about 35 trillion US dollars. This is from data from the Bank for International Settlements. Why were these swap exposures going up so rapidly? Because the interest rate swap market was taking off like a rocket and because the funding costs were so small. Remember the funding costs were about 10 basis points, almost nothing. So there was no reason for the banks to conserve space on their balance sheet. They might as well let it blow up because it was almost costless and because they weren't being monitored that closely by the regulators. Then the financial crisis hits and the regulators say, if you have large balance sheets, we're going to charge you high capital requirement. You must issue more equity. And the funding markets for new debt were saying, if you want to borrow money to, to fund all this collateral, you have to pay much higher credit spreads. Like I showed you, a factor of three times or four times as much. So the bank said, whoops, we better figure out a way to reduce our balance sheets. And in the case of interest rate swaps, Using compression trade and central clearing, the market value of outstanding derivatives has gone way down. And you might say, isn't that bad for swap market activity? Actually, no. The total volume of trade in swap markets has actually gone up. The trading activity has increased. It's only the use of balance sheet that has come down. So the, the banks have responded to these funding costs by using much more efficient financial engineering methods. OK, now we get to the math part. This is going to take about 10, maybe 15 minutes. And then we'll have some time for Q&A. OK, any questions before we launch? This is a very simple one period model. No stochastic complicated processes. Everything very simple. It's rigorous. And I'll give you the rigorous theorem proof. But mathematically, very, very simple. And in the paper, you can see the multi-period continuous time and so on. But there's a lot more work to be done in this area. So if you're interested, let me know. No questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
Sorry, to think of a... If it had not, uh, if there had not been a financial crisis, well, it looks like it's going up very steeply, right? <laughs> Probably it would have asymptoted at a very high level, maybe 60, 70 trillion. But it's hard to say because it was unsustainable. The financial crisis was going to come. The balance sheet costs being small, I'm sorry, the, the cost of funding balance sheets being small is interesting today because of these market liquidity concerns. But from a financial stability perspective, from the viewpoint of financial crises, allowing the banks to expand their balance sheet at extremely small credit spreads, almost no cost, means their balance sheets were eventually going to blow up because there had to be a financial crisis. When you have so much risk on a balance sheet with so little capital and so little funding costs. So it, probably the crisis would have happened no matter what. Because of this, not, not you know, as a kind of side factor, this was causing the financial crisis to be much deeper. I just wrote a paper on that. Let me know if you're interested. Okay, so here comes the math. There's two points in time. Today, time zero, and next period is time one. As I said, if you want to know more about the multi-period case, you can look in our paper. So this is for illustration today. And uh, we need a valuation functional called V that assigns a market value to any period one cash flows. So V is a function that says if X is the promised cash flow or the actually paid cash flow in period one, then V of X is the market value today. Okay, and we're gonna require the, this market valuation functional to satisfy two axioms. Number one, Linearity, meaning the value of a portfolio is the sum of the values of its elements. That's not very controversial. And number two, the market value goes up if you promise more cash flows in every state of the world. So this is a linear increasing functional, actually strictly increasing. And by a version of the separating hyperplane theorem, you can show that this valuation functional can be represented as an expectation of a scalar multiplied by the promised cash flow, where the expectation is with respect to a special probability measure which practitioners call the risk neutral measure, okay? So again, the valuation of X or the valuation of Y is the expectation of lambda Y where lambda is some strictly positive random variable which allows us to reduce the problem to the valuation of Y is a constant delta multiplied by the expectation of Y under a different probability measure. That expectation is denoted E star for risk neutral expectation. So this is pretty standard for everybody uh, that's done finance, uh, although there are some deeper issues here about the existence of these valuation functionals that I won't get into today. Okay, now we model you, the bank. Your bank has assets that in the next period will pay off some random amount called A for assets, and you will have some debt claims against your bank, which are, will require you to pay L, big L. L is for liabilities. And in our paper, we take L to be a random variable. Today, for simplicity, L is just a constant, a positive constant. Um, now the dealer is considering taking Yanung's trade request. Yanung would like the bank to buy some asset that pays off Y, a random variable Y. And the bank has to decide at what price or whether it would be willing to buy the asset. And uh, in order to fund the purchase of the asset, the bank will have to spend some amount U of Q, where Q is the quantity that the bank will purchase from you know. So U of Q, you can think of it as the initial price, or it could be the initial price plus the collateral requirement. Our paper handles lots of cases. Okay, so U of Q is the upfront cash requirement. That's what needs to be funded to make this purchase. Uh, we're gonna do everything in what the economists call at the margin, meaning in the sense of first order derivatives. Okay, so in our paper we do higher order approximations, but for today you can think in terms of for small amounts of this purchase, uh, how it affects uh, the bank's um, willingness to do the trade. 
And in our base case, which is the only uh, case that we'll have time to talk about today, this purchase will be funded with new debt. The word unsecured means not collateralized, just new debt, same as the old debt. Okay, and a couple of technical, one, one of the two technical assumptions is needed so that my theorem is actually a theorem. Either there's a finite number of states of the world and we avoid the singularity in which there's a non-zero probability that the assets will pay off exactly the same as the liabilities, that we get rid of that singularity. Or alternatively, we go to an infinite uh, set of states of the world. Uh, we assume that all these random variables have finite expectations. And moreover, uh, that the assets and liabilities have a continuous joint density or the case that we're focusing on today, the assets have a continuous density and the liability is just a constant amount payable. Okay, so you can either take assumption one or assumption two, whichever makes you happier, then the following theorems will work, okay? Now, if the bank buys the asset from Yanung in the amount Q, then its new assets will be A plus Q times Y. If the bank, as we're assuming, funds the purchase with new debt, then its new liabilities will be the old liability L plus the amount U of Q of funding required multiplied by the, the interest rate on the debt, which is the gross risk-free rate R plus the credit spread S. Now the credit spread will de depend on the amount purchased, so we'll call it S of Q. So this is the bank obtaining cash from the debt market to buy the assets from Yunung and the debt market will demand some credit spread S of Q. It turns out that as Q goes to zero, the credit spread converges to the pre-existing market debt spread, which is called big S, okay? And big S has an explicit formula that won't concern us today. All we need to know is that big S is the credit spread of the bank. And in a previous illustration, I think I could go back to it very quickly, this is the credit spread that we're talking about. Okay, now we do the calculation. Will the bank actually want to make this purchase when it's operating on behalf of its shareholders? It's only interested in trades with a positive shareholder return. So let's calculate the derivative with respect to the amount purchased of the market value of equity. Okay, so this is the only formula you have to actually look inside. It's the only one that has any uh, any, um, requires any mental uh, uh, attention. Okay, so uh, let's calculate this. We're gonna calculate explicitly this derivative, but let's have a look at exactly what the derivative is asking you to calculate. It's the partial derivative with respect to the amount purchased, Q, of the market value of the equity. What's that? We already agreed that the market value of any cash flow is the risk neutral expectation, E star, of the discounted, delta discounted payoff of the cash flow. Now, the equity shareholders, what is their payoff? Well, they have, their payoff is their new assets, which is A plus QY, but they have to pay the debt claims, and that's their new liabilities, which is L plus UQ times R plus SQ. So that's the new claim for equity, but we missed one important effect, which is the equity claim is zero if that random variable is negative because equity shareholders are permitted by law to walk away from any negative claims against them. So this is called the shareholder option value. Okay, so that positive sign means when you take the expectation Take the expectation of the positive part of that random variable. The negative part, you, don't, you can't get that back from the shareholders. They don't have to pay that. Okay? So that expectation is what, that partial derivative of that expectation is what we need to calculate. And we can calculate it explicitly. And we're going to do that on the next slide. And that is going to include the funding value adjustment that I spoke of a few minutes ago. Okay, that will include the funding costs. And then we'll see some examples. Okay, here's the explicit formula. The uh, value to the shareholders, that's G, the value to the shareholders 
has three terms. The first term, uh, I'm going to do this all very carefully. First term is the profit on the trade, which is called pi, multiplied by the probability p star that the shareholders actually survive default. That meaning, if the liabilities exceed the assets, the shareholders have defaulted and they walk away. With probability p star, they don't default and they get the profit on the trade. What is the profit? It's the market value of the asset that Yanung is selling, delta times e star of y, minus the upfront cost u. So pi is the profit, p star is the survival probability. So the first term is exactly what you would expect from normal trading. Normal trading incentives are, if there's a positive profit on the trade, you should go for it, and you will get it as long as your bank survives. That's the, ex that's the sort of textbook obvious trading incentive. Okay? Now the other two terms. The second term is the term that says, if I'm a shareholder and Y pays off a positive amount exactly when I'm in default, then I don't like that. That's waste. That's a waste for me because I don't want to buy assets that are going to pay off when I default because I don't get the money when I default. So I'm going to subtract delta, the discounted value, of the covariance under the risk neutral probability measure between the event of default, that's one subscript D, and the payoff of the assets Y. So this is sometimes called the wrong way position. It's wrong way, if the po covariance is positive, it's wrong way. I as a shareholder don't want to invest in assets that pay off when I won't be able to collect because my bank is defaulted. So that's a subtraction. That's not our main focus today. Our main focus is the third term, which is called the funding value adjustment. I already described it to you. It's the cost to the shareholders for borrowing the money necessary to fund the trade. And that's what I've been talking about for the last half hour. Now we have an exact mathematical formula, which is on the bottom line. It's P star times delta times the amount funded U times the credit spread. Now let's break this down. P star is the probability of survival for one year. For most US and large banks, it's 99 point some percent. It's far enough from 100% that it actually matters. The default probability is very small, but not trivial. And that's the reason that it matters is that the credit spread is proportionate to this default probability. So survival probability P star very close to one. The discount for risk-free interest rates delta is a number also very close to one. So one year discounted present value, interest rates for one year now are about 2%. So delta is around 0.98. So we have a number like 0.99 for P star, 0.98 for delta. U, just think of it per dollar. So per dollar of U, that means that almost all of the funding cost is just the credit spread S of the bank, which for current banks is around 50 basis points for the largest and most well-capitalized banks, around 50 basis points per year. Let me repeat that. If Drinja is going to buy Yanang's assets, his shareholders are going to suffer a funding cost that's roughly speaking equal to his credit spread, 50 basis points. So that means in order for his shareholders to profit from the trade, Drinja needs to charge Yanang an extra 50 basis points to make the trade worthwhile. Everybody got the import of that? And that funding value adjustment formula is actually the same formula being used in practice by the banks. They didn't have a theorem and proof for it, and they actually put it in the wrong place in their accounting, but somehow they knew what they were doing. And that's a longer story. Actually, it goes back to a phone call I got in 2012 from Goldman Sachs saying, we got this formula, and here's how we're using it. Do you think it makes sense? And I had no idea what they were talking about. So five years later, we have a research paper that's coming out in the Journal of Finance, which we finally understand what they were thinking. Uh, and they got the right answer, although they don't quite understand why. That's a long, long story to that. Okay, here again is the credit spread. 
the funding costs, as you can see, are about a factor of five bigger post-crisis than pre-crisis. So that matters because now, in order for Yunung to sell his assets, he has to suffer as a friction. He's going to be having to donate money to the bank to the extent of about 50 basis points currently in order to get a trade done. That is a new friction in markets that we didn't have before. Okay, I want to be careful of the passage of time. Um, I'm going to give you, a, here is a good opportunity. We stop at 10 sharp, is that right? Anybody know? 10 sharp, okay. So I'm going to give you an opportunity uh, to ask questions. Um, and, and, and it doesn't really matter. I don't think that you're delaying me because we pick up tomorrow morning. So wherever we live off today, that's where we start tomorrow morning. So don't be shy. This is a good opportunity to ask questions. Yes, but it's a, there's a paper, a, a separate paper on that by Yang Song for the case of collateralized debt. And it turns out that for the case of collateralized debt, uh, the funding costs are, on the debt side are smaller, but on the equity side, uh, they're quite substantial because uh, of some new rules called the leverage ratio rule. So we could talk about that later perhaps. Any other, that's a good question. Any other questions? A lot of finance I know, very little math and you're, most of you are mathematicians, uh, but I want to warm you up to what is, where the action is. There is some interesting mathematical problems here, uh, but I, I, don't want to, uh, I don't want to emphasize uh, the math today because the concepts, I think, are even more important. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. That's right. Only if G is positive will the dealer take the trade. So let's go to the conference part. That means this prime must be higher. That's exactly. You were, you were obviously listening very carefully. Ignoring the covariance term, which for the kinds of assets we're talking about, is very small. And we did some calculations in our paper to show that it's very small in most practical set settings. It's basically, does the profit on the trade exceed the funding cost? If yes, do the trade. If no, don't do the trade. That, that means, just to, just to emphasize your point again, that means that Dringia needs to extract a donation, a profit on the trade, a bid offer spread, pi, that's at least as big as his credit spread in order for him to want to do the trade. Yeah. But my question is that given this price, not just a funding spread, but just a cost, that's what we have the this dealer will charge. It's kind of between these two, right? The dealer will charge a bid offer spread that is a trading profit that must exceed that's pi, that must exceed the funding cost. Uh, it get, it's a little bit more complicated in a multi-period setting, but that's roughly the idea. The reason it's more complicated in a multi-period setting is that you don't necessarily need to hold the asset to final maturity. You could sell it tomorrow and get lucky to another customer, earn another bid offer spread, and you only had to carry the funding cost for one day. So there's a big stochastic control problem that underlies this that I'm working on now with uh, an economist at the University of Washington named Yao Zhang. And that's actually a really interesting stochastic control problem. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So, can the dealer pass through the, uh, the cost of uh, funding rate adjustment as a commission fee? They... Yeah. So, Junjia will tell Yunung, here's the price I offer you. He doesn't say, I'm breaking down the price to, it's worth $100, but I'm only offering you $99.50 because of my funding cost. He just says, I'm willing to buy it for 99.50. And if Yunung says, gosh, I wonder if that's a good price, he can shop around. The next bank that he goes to might have bigger funding costs, or they might know that they have small funding costs, but his only alternative is to go back to Jinja. So this search and bargaining kind of setting is much different than an exchange. This friction will persist um, across the market uh, to have an effect. And we show in our paper a substantial effect. Yes, you can see uh, improvement in the bid offer spread. It's gone down, and a lot is not all trioptima. Some of it is trioptima, and some of it is the breaking up of the oligopolistic uh, bank dealerships by new entrants, like the hedge fund called Citadel. 
which doesn't have very high funding costs uh, because of its structure, and it can underbid the dealers for these funding costs and also can force them to compete harder. So that's another big story. That, that uh, core periphery structure is being invaded by one or two non-bank uh, trading firms like Citadel, uh, which is a Chicago-based giant hedge fund. Th these are fantastic uh, issues that are currently being ex explored. The other opportunity, of course, is to set up an exchange where we don't rely on the dealer so much. We can actually, the Yanang could bid against everybody else in the room on a central exchange. He's going to get a much better deal. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to talk about that for a few minutes and what that would do to the market design. Any other questions? We're just rolling up. The second hand is approaching the top of the hour. Last chance. Junja. That's correct. That's uh, uh, frictional, that's fixed costs. So this is addressed in Chao Jun's, uh, Chao Jun Wang's paper. So if there's a cost to maintaining a relationship, uh, then you won't necessarily have a relationship with every single dealer. So in practice, a hedge fund might have one, two, or three large dealers to whom it's connected. And a bank, uh, a, a, pardon me, an insurance company that's buying bonds might have three, four, five different banks that it buys from but not all of the banks, because these are costly relationships to maintain. That's a good question. OK, well, now the second hand is past the top of the hour. And uh, we have a break. And then I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>